Joining me today, Sander Kraut, Sander Katz. I love the nickname, by the way. Sander, thank you so much for being on my show. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm so happy that you're interested. You know, I'm more than interested. I'm uh, absolutely uh, all in. I've been doing some fermenting at home for the past few years. I'm only in chapter two of your book and already hooked. I talked to my wife the other day. I said, you have to read this, but not until I'm done with it because I don't want to lose it. I am. In fact, I, I have to tell you this. This is true. Reading puts me to sleep. And I was wiped out at the end of the day. I'm ready to go to bed and I start reading your book and I couldn't go to sleep. I, it was, I was just getting, the more I read, the more excited I got. I can't wait to get back into it. But I also want you to be bold and correct me when I'm wrong. Okay, I'm going to use terms, I'm going to mess up, I'm going to, you know, uh, use culture and ferment and pickle and cure and brew and other terms that might be used in this discussion. I'm going to use them wrong. Please do correct me so that we can all benefit and learn from this. Okay. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and and may, may, may I ask which of my books you were reading that kept absolutely. you up at night? I've got it right here. Okay. It's the updated wild okay. fermentation. Great, wild fermentation. Let me just show people that I also have um, um, The Art of Fermentation, which, which is a much more um, um, in-depth uh, 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 book. Um, and um, coming out in October, my latest book, which is called Fermentation Journeys. And it's about um, other fermented foods that I've encountered, uh, mostly in my travels. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm, I, I can't wait. And I know I'm going to be getting those books too. I'm absolutely loving this one. And I know it's going to change the way I'm already uh, fermenting, brewing, culturing. <laughs> we'll get into those words. Um, but nowadays, people are terrified of microbiology. So before we talk about the microbiology in our food, can you tell me a little bit about the, you know, symbiotic relationship we should have these? You seem like a very passionate person, passionate about relationships with people, but also with microbiology. Sure. Well, okay. I mean, first of all, we have to acknowledge that, um, uh, you know, humans knew nothing of the existence of microorganisms until the 19th century. Um, you know, even though in the context of fermented foods and beverages, we've been working with microorganisms for many thousands of years. And, you know, arguably we and all forms of life have evolved from microorganisms. So, um, so they're really our ancestors. Uh, and yet we didn't specifically know of their existence until about 150 years ago. And, um, you know, really in the popular imagination, uh, uh, since the earliest triumphs of the field of microbiology, involved identifying bacteria that were um, um, understood to be um, uh, the cause of various diseases, um, you know, which generated this revolution in, in uh, uh, medicine, antibiotics. So, you know, in the popular imagination, you know, bacteria and other microorganisms became something something to fear. Um, and for the last 150 years, you know, humans have been engaged in what I would describe as the war uh, on bacteria. Um, you know, and yet, um, you know, anyone who has been following um, uh, new findings in microbiology, um, you know, we are, we are understanding more and more that, you know, we and all life live in a microbial matrix and you know a healthy human being is host to trillions of microorganisms that exist in elaborate communities and you know really support our functionality in all kinds of ways you know from our digestive systems to our immune systems to you know regulating things like our brain chemistry and you know really it seems like you know every month there are new findings uh, 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 that are that are showing us you know just how important microorganisms are to our existence and functionality um, you know and yet we're still trapped in this um, war on bacteria mindset that sort of sees them all as dangerous. And I think that, you know, we can acknowledge that there exist bacteria that have the potential to make us sick. And yet at the same time, you know, our greatest defense against those bacteria are healthy, 
thriving, biodiverse, um, um, you know, systems of microbes in, on, and around our bodies. You know, I, that's probably one of the most profound statements I've heard about microbiology in a long time. You know, people feel threatened by them and our greatest defense against those harmful pathogenic is more <laughs> microbiology. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, um, um, you know, the, 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 you know, the war on bacteria um, um, uh, uh, strategy tactic, which, um, uh, you know, would involve, um, you know, the overuse of antibiotic drugs, use of all these um, um, antibacterial cleansing products, um, you know, really what it has the, um, uh, the effect of doing is diminishing biodiversity. And it's the biodiversity that, that really we rely on to protect us. And, you know, actually, um, um, you know, it makes us more vulnerable rather than less vulnerable to, um, 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 to illness. So we need biodiversity. And yet there are all of these factors in our contemporary lives from, you know, chemical exposure like antibiotics, antibacterial material cleansing products, um, chlorine in our water systems, um, as well as changes in our diet. I mean, just the fact that we eat less fiber than our ancestors did. And it is the fiber that, you know, largely feeds the bacteria along the entire length of our intestines. Um, and, um, you know, for, you know, for a number of factors, um, uh, uh, you know, we have less biodiversity than people in the past. And, and I would say that, um, you know, an, an, an important, um, uh, uh, you know, way that we can potentially improve our health is by trying to um, restore biodiversity in the gut. And, you know, one way that people can do this is by incorporating live fermented foods into their diets. I agree. And, you know, it's interesting because I would say that your concepts are revolutionary. And I don't know if you can use revolutionary to refer to going back, restoring what once was, but you're doing it. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, I, I don't know that we can go back and restore what once was, but I think that, you know, we have to recognize that biodiversity is our friend. And, um, you know, in every cultural tradition around the world, you know, there are traditional uh, uh, foods and beverages that are uh, bacteria rich. And, um, you know, one way that we can, you know, support our bodies by, by you know, improving biodiversity in the gut is by trying to incorporate, uh, um, you know, a diverse range of fermented foods and beverages into our diets. Yeah, well, take me back in time a little bit. How, what's your story? How did you get into fermentation? Uh, how did you learn about it? Uh, what was the first thing you fermented? Did you share well, it with people? Yeah, sure, I did. Um, <laughs> I, I, let me first of all say that I, I have I have no formal background. I, I have not studied microbiology. I didn't go to culinary school. I didn't study food safety. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a liberal arts background. I grew up in a family where we loved pickles. And, um, you know, my, my maternal grandparents, the grandparents I grew up around and, and knew well, were immigrants from what's now Belarus. And, um, you know, we were living in New York City. And, um, you know, there's a big Eastern European immigrant population in New York and wonderful delicatessens. And um, I loved pickles as a kid. I, I wasn't thinking about fermentation. I I had no idea how the pickles were made. I wasn't watching my grandmother make them. She wasn't making them. She was buying them at a deli, but I was drawn to this flavor. So from the time I was a little kid, I was drawn to the lactic acid flavor of, of fermentation. Um, when I was in my 20s, I spent a couple of years following a macrobiotic diet and macrobiotics really um, uh, emphasizes the digestive benefit of pickles and other live ferments. And, you know, I started noticing that these pickles that I had loved for my entire life, whenever I would bite into them, I could feel the salivary glands under my tongue squirting out saliva. And I began to associate these foods in a very tangible way with getting my digestive juices flowing. 
Uh, Macrobiotics also talked a little bit about the immune stimulation of these live fermented foods. And, you know, I just started thinking about these foods uh, as, as a health practice. Um, um, you know, I had a health challenge of my own. I, I tested HIV positive in 1991. And, you know, I never, I never looked to fermented foods as, a, you know, as, as, as a cure for HIV, but mm-hmm. I was interested in, you know, nutritional solutions, any ways that I could, um, you know, use nutrition to make my body as resilient as possible. And, and so, you know, I was thinking a lot about nutrition and, and, and diet in that context. Um, in 1993, but, but none of that really really got me making fermented foods. It got me eating fermented foods. Um, What got me making fermented foods is that in 1993, I moved from New York to rural Tennessee and I got involved in keeping a garden. And I was such a naive city kid that it had never occurred to me that in a garden, all of the cabbage would be ready at about the same time. And all of the radishes would be ready at about the same time. And all of the cucumbers would be ready at about the same time. So, um, you know, when I was faced with this rather obvious reality of um, food production, um, I I decided I would learn how to ferment. I, I, mean, I mean, I knew that sauerkraut had something to do with preserving cabbage. We had a beautiful row of cabbages and I decided I would learn how to make sauerkraut. I looked at the joy of cooking. I learned how to make sauerkraut from the joy of cooking. Um, I, I couldn't believe how simple and straightforward it was. Um, you know, well, you, you chop up the cabbage, you lightly salt it. I got in there with my hands and squeezed it a little bit to make it extra juicy. I, um, I added some caraway seeds and, uh, you know, I loved it. And of course I shared it with my friends. Um, um, you know, I, I was excited and then I started playing around with it. Okay. It works so well with cabbage. What happens if you do it with turnips? What happens if you do it with carrots? I, I just started playing with other kinds of vegetables. I, I learned how to make yogurt. I learned how to make country wine. And I, you know, I just kind of, um, you know, went into the rabbit hole of fermentation and, you know, just started learning that there are traditions of fermentation everywhere that every food can be fermented fermented that, you know, fermentation creates, you know, wonderful, delicious flavors. It, you know, it's mm-hmm. not, it's not, you know, just about, you know, something that's good for you, but doesn't taste very good. I mean, you know, many of the greatest delicacies of the world are produced by fermentation and, um, you know, I've never stopped, but I did discover the first time I taught a sauerkraut making workshop, which was in 1998, that a lot of people are terrified of the idea of cultivating bacteria in a jar or a crock. And, you know, the big anxiety is, you know, how do I know that there are good bacteria growing in that jar and not something dangerous that might um, uh, uh, make me sick or, or even kill somebody? So, you know, it's very easy for people to project all of of their anxiety about bacteria onto the idea of fermentation. And what I can tell you about fermenting vegetables is there's simply no case history anywhere of illness or food poisoning from fermentation. Like this is about as safe as it gets. The process of fermentation makes the vegetables safer than they are raw. And I certainly hope no one is, you know, avoiding eating raw vegetables because, you know, a couple of times they have read about um, um, you know, people who got sick from eating raw vegetables that had been exposed to some random pathogen. I mean, that does happen. But if we were to shred vegetables that had been exposed to some random pathogen like that and ferment them, well, you know, the indigenous uh, uh, um, uh, bacteria would win out and the lactic acid bacteria would dominate. They do every single time you get vegetables submerged in a, in a, in a salty liquid. And, um, and, and, and as they create acids and change the environment, it would destroy the pathogens. And, you know, something that's very convenient and elegant for us is that, you know, the organization, the, the, the organisms that we worry about in a food poisoning context cannot survive in a sufficiently acidic environment, which is why acidification is so, um, um, you know, closely related to food safety and food preservation. And it's why, you know, every every culture around the world has pickles because pickles are, are foods preserved in an acidic 
uh, 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 medium. And, you know, most of the pickles we find on contemporary supermarket shelves just had a hot vinegar solution poured over them. And then mm. they were heat processed in contrast to most of the old world pickles where you have the vegetables in a salt water solution and they develop lactic acid, a different flavor, a different compound. Um, but in either case, they are equally effective at keeping the food safe and preserving the okay. vegetables. Okay. Not necessarily the same health benefits, but pre from a preservation perspective. Yeah. And, and, and a I, safety perspective. I, I think you answered one of my other questions, which was, what's the difference between uh, vegetation rotting and fermenting? And you mentioned the word submerged. Well, I, I mean, okay. So, so... I mean, I would describe fermentation as the transformative action of microorganisms, but generally we reserve this word to describe intentional or desirable transformations. But, um, you know, let's just acknowledge that, you know, at a, at a, at a certain point there, there, you know, there is not always like a sharp dividing line. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of foods that would be considered a great delicacy in one cultural context that might be, you know, considered the worst nightmare in another cultural context. So, I mean, I think we can all see this in the realm of cheese, right? So, I mean, you know, there exist all kinds of cheeses and, and um, you know, as, as, as uh, time has gone on, I have come to enjoy stronger and stronger cheeses. And, you know, now mm. the further away I can smell a cheese, the more eager I am to taste it, but I didn't always feel that way. And, and most of the cheeses that I get really excited about now, you know, as, as, a, as a kid, I would have been disgusted by them. And, you know, I observe that a lot of people are disgusted by them and, um, and would consider them to be rotten. Or, you know, we could take an example uh, like, you know, fermented tofu. I've, I've, I've only visited China once, but I had a wonderful uh, uh, visit there. And I'm, you know, I'm really, really interested in... Um, in Chinese cuisine and they have, you know, really some of the most elaborate fermentation traditions in the world. And, um, you know, I would say that there's as much variation in, in the realm of fermented tofu as there is in the realm of fermented milk. Um, um, and some of them are quite extreme and some of them are extremely mild. And, um, you know, people come to love these more extreme flavors, not because anyone is ever born loving them, but we learn to love them. And once we become attached to some of these strong flavors, um, you know, I would say this even qualifies for, you know, coffee or beer. But, you know, once we, once we, just, once we key into what's so, you know, pleasurable about those strong flavors, like nothing else replaces them. And the world of fermented foods and beverages is full of that. And sometimes this boundary between fermented to perfection and rotten, you know, can be a very fuzzy boundary that differs from person to person and from cultural context to cultural context. But, you know, generally fermentation would be regarded as a strategy to prevent food from rotting. Okay. Uh, you know, in, in chapter two of uh, Wild Fermentation book, uh, I read about, you know, Louis Pasteur and how he was kind of credited for revolutionizing industrial production of uh, drinks, uh, I think primarily alcohol. And, uh, you know, one of the things he employed was heat probably to sterilize and kill off and then reseeding with a known culture to get consistent results, which of course increase profitability. In home practice, are you ever heating and starting fresh or is it for the most part starting raw? Well, it just depends what I'm fermenting. Um, um, so, uh, I mean, certainly when I make wines for, you know, which is generally driven by fresh fruit, I actually have blueberry wine, um, uh, on the other side of my kitchen that you can't see, but, um, you know, last week I, I, I picked a couple of gallons of blueberries at my friends, uh, in my friend's field of blueberries. And I basically just covered them with a sugar water solution, uh, the yeast is on the berries. I'm just, I'm just like stirring it every day to, 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 to um, uh, 
you know, spread the yeast around and make sure that the yeast comes into contact with um, uh, as much of the solution as possible. It got all bubbly. The bubbles have lifted it up. So now I have to stir it every day just to get the blueberries back in there and make sure that as much of the flavor as possible gets infused into the into the solution to, to, to flavor the wine. Um, so in that case, I'm not employing any heat whatsoever. When I make yogurt, you know, it turns out that to make yogurt thick, which is a quality that I really enjoy in the yogurt, what I'm used to in yogurt, um, um, to make yogurt really thick, you have to denature the proteins. Proteins all have a physical structure and, you know, there are various ways of manipulating the structure. When you whip cream or when you whip egg whites, you are um, manipulating the structure of the protein and, 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 and changing it. Um, but when you heat milk, um, um, you're, you're, you're changing the structure of the protein. So I generally heat milk to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I cool it down to about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I introduce my yogurt cultures and try to keep it around 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, um, I usually do it for like 12 to 16 hours. Um, um, and so denaturing the protein turns out to be critical if you want the yogurt to be that thick. I mean, plenty of people make raw milk yogurt where they never heat it beyond the 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's fine, but it just, you know, it, it just uh, uh, makes a much runnier style of yogurt um, um, that, that doesn't have that thickness. So I wouldn't say that I, you know, never, you know, cook any of these things. I mean, certain, certain foods, you have to cook the substrate before you make it. Like I like to make tempeh. I like to make miso. Um, I like to make natto. Um, these all involve, you know, cooking the beans, um, um, uh, you know, and then, and then you cool it down before you introduce the culture. But um, um, I mean, there's a lot of examples of fermentation of cooked substrates as well as fermentation of raw substrates. And then, you know, if you think about something like bread, I mean, sure, you could eat raw sourdough dough, um, you know, all day long, and it would be full of um, um, probiotics. But who wants to eat raw dough? It's not very good. It's not going to make you feel very good. Um, and so, you know, you put it in the hot oven and you cook it when you make bread. And um, and the bread has many virtues, but um, you know, the bacteria that 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 rose it are are killed by the high heat. Oh my goodness. Talking to you, I have more and more questions popping up. I know I'm not going to get to them all, but I want to go with a couple of them right now. I assume you're getting your milk raw if you have to heat it to change the proteins, as you mentioned. Um, well, I mean, I do, I, I, I mean, I do get some raw goat milk from, uh, from neighbors of mine. Um, but I, I mean, I mean, actually I, I prefer to make yogurt out of cow's milk and I buy, um, you know, pasteurized organic, uh, 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 cow's milk, but pasteurization doesn't necessarily bring it high enough to denature the proteins. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm actually heating it higher than pasteurized pa pasteurization temperature. I, I might have to try that. I just made a batch, uh, a two and a half gallon batch with, with uh, organic pasteurized milk and it came out nice and thick, but I wonder yeah. if I might get different results. So I'm going to try something new. Okay. Well, and, and, and also if you're getting good results, I mean, I, I mean, I never like to suggest that like my way is the only way or, um, or the best way. I mean, people like every fermentation process I've been able to learn anything about I find people doing it different ways. And, um, you know, it is not a standardized practice. Um, um, you know, these are practices that have evolved over the course of thousands of years in people's kitchens. And there's always a wide variety of ways in which people do it. Yeah. And I'm always learning from people who I talk to who do things differently. You mentioned your blueberry, which I think, by the way, is going to be one of those you have to share with friends, no doubt. <laughs> the blueberry wine. I never even thought about blueberry wine. And I made my own wine by mistake. I pictured a, I, I, I purchased a uh, container of raw grape juice from the Amish and forgot it in my refrigerator. And when I opened it up, it was delicious. It was fermented. It was fizzy. I mean, when I probably the first, um, um, you know, fermented beverage I ever had was when I was a kid, we used to buy um, raw cider. 
and you know it was in plastic gallon sized containers and my sister my little sister and I would notice that um, uh, the containers would bulge and then when we'd open it up it would be a little bit fizzy and we used to call it fuzzy cider oh boy. Um, um, but it was you know lightly fermented and some people would be afraid of that and throw it away <laughs> Well, um, you, you mentioned um, making your own yogurt and what are you using for a starter culture, a previous batch or a starter? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I've, uh, okay. So, so, so the, the expression in the technical literature in English for when you use a previous batch of something as the starter for the next batch is back slopping. Um, and I have been back back slopping for years with an heirloom yogurt culture. So, you know, if, I mean, for, year, for, for years before that, I would go to the supermarket and I'd buy one of the commercial brands. I'd buy, you know, plain whole milk yogurt and I'd use that as a starter. And my first bat, my first generation would always be great, but then my second generation would never be as thick as the first generation. And then if I dared try a third generation, it wasn't recognizable as yogurt anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'd go back Back to the store and buy some more but it was this perplexing question for me why you know why can't it continue over the course of multiple generations and basically you know store milk yogurt store store bought yogurts for the most part are not made with traditional yogurt cultures i mean understand that for you know in the in the early years of you know industrializing fermentation you know the 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 the, the heirloom traditional cultures were viewed as scary things because there were all of these unidentified bacteria in them and so you know early microbiologists set out as a project to identify which organisms were critical. So, you know, out of a sample of Bulgarian yogurt, this, um, our, you know, renowned early microbiologist, Eli Mechnikov, identified Streptococcus thermophilus and uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus as, you know, the essential bacteria for making yogurt. And, you know, basically, you know, most commercial yogurt is made with sort of, you um, um, uh, pure strain starters of these two strains and possibly a third or a fourth added in. But, you know, they're, they're, they're all individual lines added together to make the yogurt. And so, um, um, you know, that, that stands in strong contrast to the traditional yogurt starters, which were really these evolved communities. And evolved communities evolve with structures, with the ability to defend themselves against, you know, random bacterial exposure, against these viruses called phages, which can attack bacteria. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the structures of the heirloom cultures actually have much more um, longevity and resilience than the pure culture starters. Um, so, uh, you know, in wild fermentation, I wrote about this uh, uh, New York City conishery on Houston Street called Yona Schimmel. And um, a student of mine who lived in the U, uh, 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 someone who read my book who lived in the UK was in New York, bought some of this yogurt, brought some of it back to the UK. Uh, some years later, she organized a workshop that we taught together in the UK and she had starter from that uh, um, uh, yogurt. And so I tried this technique that I had read about that immigrants would sometimes use of, I, I spread some yogurt on a clean piece of cloth. I put it in the window to dry. I had this crusty, dried cloth with bits of yogurt on it. I packed it in my luggage and brought it home. I made a small batch of yogurt from that. I expanded it into a larger batch. And for about 10 years now, I've been making yogurt by back slopping <laughs> from that original uh, uh, sample. Well, that's so cool. <laughs> that really is unique. I didn't, I, I'm uh, but learning if you so look, much. If, if people look on the internet, you can find various heirloom yogurt starters for sale. And I would say that, you know, even, you know, if it seems, you know, expensive, you'll be able to continue using it over the course of many generations for making yogurt rather than having to buy uh, a, a supermarket yogurt every, uh, uh, you know, every other batch of yogurt. Yeah. Tell me a little bit of, of, about bread. My first example, my first, um, the first time I actually started bread uh, from the air, didn't uh, infuse it with a, a yeast culture. Um, I guess this goes back to preferences too. It eventually, you know, rose nicely, but it wasn't for my taste buds, the tastiest bread. Uh, what's your experience and how do you start that? Are you keeping a lump aside from something that is tasty? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, so, so I, I mean, this is my sourdough that I've, you know, started from flour and water 25 years ago. Now, a lot of people and I might have um, in, in wild fermentation, I might have, um, you know, uh, um, um, uh, uh, suggested to people that that the that the organisms are mostly coming from the air while the air will always have some influence um you know really most of that yeast and bacteria is on the flour like all of the high carbohydrate um uh, uh plant materials fruits grains yeah really any kind of vegetables um are going to have cells of yeast and lactic acid bacteria on them. So, you know, wheat always has uh, 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 these organisms, rye always has these organisms. And so the flour from these um, uh, uh, grains always has the organisms that can rise the bread. And so, you know, they are in a state of dormancy because the grain is dry, but as soon as you introduce some water, they can come to life and begin to access nutrients and proliferate. And it takes a little bit of cultivation to get them vigorous enough to be able to rise bread. Um, the flavor of the bread, you know, really is all about the technique of how you use it. It's not so much intrinsic to the starter as, you know, it has to do with the proportions that you use, the amount of time, the temperature, um, you know, um, you know, in a community of organisms like this, there, there's a dance between dif the different kinds of organisms. And, you know, if you uh, let, let's talk about the proportion of feeding it. You know, if you feed a little bit of flour to this over and over again, you're going to develop a much more acidic um, um, uh, 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 flavor. Um, uh, where the lactic acid bacteria are really going to be dominating and their byproducts are really um, um, the, the overpowering flavor. On the other hand, if you dilute this, if you do what I would describe as a high proportion feeding, where you feed a relatively smaller proportion of the starter, a relatively larger proportion of fresh water and flour, you are diluting the acidity, which enables the yeast to be much more vigorous. And so, you know, depending on proportions, depending on timing, depending on temperature, you actually can make, I mean, some people object to using the word sourdough to describe this because you don't have to make bread that's sour at all. Mm -hmm. right. um, um, you can make, you know, very, very mild bread. It, you know, it just takes a certain amount of experience and, um, 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 you know, I, I mean, yeast, yeast is the most widely available, you know, pure culture starter, um, you know, just as a, as a matter of, you um, um, uh, you know, principle just to show people that you don't need pure yeast for anything. I mean, I haven't used pure yeast in, in decades in, 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 in my practice. Um, you know, it's on all the berries for all the, you know, um, um, you know, wines or alcohol that you would want to make. It's in honey for all the mead you would want to make. It's on the grains for all the bread you would want to make. Um, so, you know, I've just worked with, you know, the, 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 the wild yeast, but, but organisms are never alone. They're never singular. That is a human technological invention. So, um, you know, traditional bread for the last 10,000 years until the 20th century, all had yeast along with lactic acid bacteria. And, um, you know, that lactic acid bacteria gives the bread more flavor, whether you take it to the extreme and have a very sour bread, or you let it be more moderate, it makes the bread last longer and uh, 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 slows down the molding of, of, of bread. Um, um, you know, it makes the bread more nutritious because the bacterial fermentation uh, breaks down chemical bonds that um, um, make the mineral uh, uh, elements of the grains more accessible to us. And it even breaks down the gluten. So, you know, we have this mm -hmm. huge crisis of, of gluten intolerance. Well, um, uh, you know, the bacteria of lactic, uh, lactic acid bacteria breaks
break down gluten and they won't necessarily make it zero gluten, but a, a significantly lower gluten content than a bread made with um, um, pure culture yeast. So there are a lot of advantages to working with a, a mixed culture, uh, uh, natural fermentation. The main disadvantage is it takes a little bit longer and we live in a culture where time is money. And it also takes more, um, you know, it, it takes more education. Like you have to, you have to, it takes a longer time to learn. It's experiential education. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, in that, one of the things that you mentioned that was brand new to me that I had read about in, in the first chapter was mead. I never heard of that before. Honey and water cultured, uh, first fermented beverage. Never knew that. <laughs> um, something that a lot of people are afraid of meat. How did they do it in the past? Um, how was it cultured? Uh, they didn't, they couldn't refrigerate it. Was it cooked first or warmed or how long would it last outside of the refrigeration once cultured? Well, I mean, okay. I mean, there's not one way of doing it. I mean, it, you know, it really depends so much on the environment of the part of the world where you are. So, you know, one of the limitations of fermentation as a method for preserving meat is that, you know, when we're talking about milk, when we're talking about vegetables, um, uh, uh, you know, there are carbohydrates and the lactic acid or the acetic acid or the alcohol, which are the three uh, major biopreservatives that can be produced by fermentation. They're all produced by carbohydrates. What meat and fish lack are carbohydrates. Uh, uh, they have, uh, you know, exceedingly small um, um, uh, amounts of carbohydrates. So, you know, one strategy for fermenting meat and fish is to introduce a carbohydrate. And um, um, uh, so, I mean, if we look at salami, salami is dry cured sausage. It's generally eaten raw. Usually nobody ever cooks a salami. It's not cooked before and it's not cooked after. Um, but it's not fermentation alone that is preserving it. Fermentation is a critical part of it. And therefore, a little bit of either sugar in most contemporary uh, 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 salami production, um, or uh, I did a workshop in Majorca and I learned about uh, like a style of, of sausage that they eat there. They put a lot of um, paprika in, a particular kind of a sweet pepper. And that's a source of carbohydrates. The source of carbohydrates could simply be garlic. Um, I mean, right here in my kitchen right now, I have, I have a batch of nam, which is a Thai name for pork fermented with a paste of rice, um, garlic, and salt. Um, so the Gar the, so the, so the um, rice is the source of carbohydrates. And as the organisms of the garlic um, ferment the garlic and the rice, it creates an acidic environment that flavors and helps preserve the meat. So, you know, right here in the middle of the summer in my Tennessee kitchen, you know, I have a bag with, um, you know, some ribs covered with this paste. And, you know, I started it on Saturday and I'm going to let it go until Wednesday. And, and I mean, then I will cook them. Um, but many fermented meats don't get cooked, such as uh, such as a salami. But you know what I would emphasize is that like it's very rarely fermentation alone. The places I've heard of where it's fermentation alone, it's actually fermentation in concert with low temperatures. So a lot of the Arctic traditions don't add any salt, don't do any drying. They're just relying on a spontaneous fermentation of the fish or the marine mammals or the birds, um, you know, in a, in a moderate temperature uh, uh, environment. Most of the other ones either introduce a carbohydrate, they involve a step of drying and or salting. Um, so in the realm of fish and meat, which are higher protein substrates um, that are, you know, have greater intrinsic danger, um, people tend to um, stack preservation techniques. And so, you know, you could dry meat, you could put meat in vinegar, 
but both of these would make something that's like not as not as delicious if you apply several methods each in moderation you can make something that is just as safe and um uh, uh more delicious so wow. i mean it's a comp it's a complicated uh um, um area um in my book uh, uh the art of fermentation i have a big chapter about fermenting meat and fish and in my forthcoming book fermentation journeys, um, um, I have a lot of, you know, interesting examples that I've learned about in more recent times. Um, I mean, I'll just talk about one of them right now, which is sushi. Okay, so so sushi's gone global. Would you eat in a sushi restaurant that didn't have a refrigerator? Um, you know, sushi wasn't invented in the 20th century. Sushi is an ancient Japanese tradition. And, um, you know, a lot of the sushi in, in places away from the coast involved fermenting fish in a bed of rice. Mm. And the rice is the carbohydrate that produces acids that enable the fish to be preserved either for a short period of time or in certain cases for a long period of time. And there are a lot of um, traditions like this around the world, not just in Japan. Interesting. Wow. Tell me about some of the equipment people would use. I know everyone probably already has everything they need, but over time, I would imagine you acquired a few things that you didn't have, and it probably became favorite things that you use for culturing. What do, what do you use for equipment? Well, sure. I mean, I have a, I have a beautiful collection of Crocs. Um, you know, I, I mean, some that I have bought that are the, um, you know, uh, standard American style of cylindrical Crocs, but, you know, many beautiful artisanal Crocs that, that people have, have gifted me with. And, um, um, you know, Cro Crocs are wonderful and beautiful. Um, um, I mean, certainly, I, I mean, I have an incubator. I, I basically turned uh, like a defunct commercial refrigerator that, uh, you know, I found that was being thrown away at a kitchen supply store. Um, um, and I, I put an incandescent light bulb in it and a little greenhouse temperature controller sensor um, so I can keep it, um, you know, 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the range for growing uh, uh, the fungus for tempeh or for koji, which is the starter that I use for miso or sake or soy sauce. Um, uh, um, I, I mean, I have various equipment that I use, but really what I like to emphasize with people is, is like most of the projects that I do do not require any special equipment. And, you know, the most common fermentation vessel that I use is a jar. A wide mouth jar is just much easier to deal with for most uh, uh, solid food applications than a narrow necked jar. But you know, you don't even have to buy a special jar. You can work with a mayonnaise jar or or whatever whatever you have. So um, uh, I mean, jars are just you know the the the, the primary. Um, uh, uh, vessels that I work with. Now, um, um, you know, I, I mean, I do do larger batches. Um, um, I mean, really jars max out probably at about two gallons. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I have 10 gallon crocs. I've worked in... Um, I've worked in wooden barrels. I've done 55 gallon batches of, of sauerkraut in wooden barrels. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful specialized equipment that you can use, especially if you get interested in larger batches. But, um, um, you know, the history of fermentation is, is ancient. Um, you know, there, there's evidence that like up until the time of World War II, there were communities that were making sauerkraut in pits in the ground. Um, you know, it does not require a lot of specialized equipment. And I just want to encourage people to not allow the specialized equipment they do not possess to be the reason why you don't do this. If you're interested in doing this, just start small in a, in a jar. A quart-sized jar has a capacity of about two pounds of vegetables. Um, and that's really perfect for a small household to uh, uh, to get it started. And then, you know, then if your if your family loves it, then, you know, find a gallon size jar um, um, and that'll hold about eight pounds. And then if you really love it, then, you know, go and invest in a nice uh, ceramic crock, which, you know, you can buy used in an antique mall, um, uh, you know, all over the United States. People have umbrellas in, in beautiful ceramic crocks um, and um, go from there. 
I'm, I'm laughing because you're describing the same process I've been through myself, you know, starting out with the mayonnaise jars and uh, now all the glasses in our cabinet, we don't have regular glasses to drink out of. They're just all different size ball glass jars. And I finally found a gallon size. And then recently I acquired a two and a half gallon, which is the biggest I could find, like you say. Um, but then I, I, I saw a video of you. I think it was um, like a New York Times documentary or something. And you had your hands in like a big wooden container of sauerkraut and just kind of scooping it up and stuffing it in, into the smaller uh, jars. Do you yeah, remember yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's fun talking with you and 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 realizing I'm on that path just a lot before you know uh, much younger in my journey here. I've got a lot to learn, and this is just wonderful. Um, we t kind of touched on this. What happens if you ferment a contaminated vegetable? And you kind of already touched on it. Yeah, I mean, okay. So first of all, um, you know, to the degree that you can work with, you know, fresh, fresh produce. Um, um, you know, if you're working with root vegetables, you have to wash them and scrub them. Otherwise, you'll have, you know, grit and sand in your vegetables. You don't have to worry about washing away the bacteria. Um, um, the bacteria are very hardy and um, uh, they will withstand the, 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 the washing. I generally will leave the skins on uh, um, most vegetables, but it depends what I'm fermenting. Like I love to ferment uh, uh, celeriac, celery root and you have to peel that um uh, it's a really gnarly skin and and the celery root ferments fine uh, uh 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 anyway um i mean in terms of you, you know i mean generally if vegetables are contaminated it means one of two things it means either the field was downhill from a factory farm and, you know, manure from the factory farm washed down and exposed the vegetables. Or it means that like somebody failed to wash their hands at critical, you know, uh, 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 moments of hygienic intervention. And, you know, then they got fecal matter onto the vegetables. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can avoid that by washing your vegetables. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, let's just say that you failed to do that or you failed to do that adequately and you shred them. I mean, once you get your vegetables submerged, see, here's the thing is we, if we had a bowl of loosely shredded vegetables, it's very predictable what would happen, what would dominate out of that community of organisms that are on a vegetable. And that would be molds. And, you know, we see that anytime we leave a half of a cabbage sitting, even in the refrigerator for a few days, mm. you get this little dark growth over the cut surface of it. Well, if you leave a bowl of shredded vegetables, like, uh, um, um, on your kitchen counter in hot, humid weather, you know, every cut surface will be like that. And you'll end up with this cloud of hairy mold that could reduce a bowl of shredded vegetables to uh, a puddle of slime that bears no resemblance whatsoever to delicious, tangy, crunchy sauerkraut. And so, you know, getting it submerged basically protects the vegetables from the free flow of oxygen and makes it so those mold uh, uh, spores that are inevitably present cannot develop. And what will develop instead every single time are lactic acid bacteria. And as the lactic acid bacteria proliferate, they produce this byproduct, lactic acid. Um, and the lactic acid would kill any cells that happen to be on there of coliform bacteria or salmonella or, you know, other organisms that, um, uh, um, you know, we would be concerned about. Yeah. So acidification is yeah. our friend. Yeah. And, and in the realm of raw, raw uh, 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 vegetables or fruits, um, you know, there, there's really just no need to be concerned about safety. Like the things that can go wrong will be abundantly uh, 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 clear. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a story about someone that whose life was changed by fermentation other than yourself. We already know, <laughs> but certainly you've introduced this too. And by sharing it with other people, uh, tell me a story about someone that just, really lit you up because of the change you saw in them. 
Well, I mean, you know, it has just been such a, you know, gratifying, uh, um, you know, feature of my life, you know, for almost 20 years since Wild Fermentation first came out of, you know, hearing from people who said that, you know, they had been living with, you know, chronic digestive problems until they, you know, got the idea to try introducing fermented foods or live fermented foods in, into their diets. And I should just point out that, you know, not all fermented foods foods still have living bacteria. So, you know, you can buy a can of sauerkraut at the supermarket. Well, you know, that was produced the same way all sauerkraut is made. Um, but, you know, then it was heat processed so it could sit in the can at the supermarket. Um, so, um, um, I mean, it's yeah. possible to buy products of fermentation that do not have live cultures in them, but, right. um, uh, you know, it's really the live cultures that are, that are mostly behind the, you know, improvements in people's digestive health that I hear about all the time. Yeah. And so, you know, I've heard this from people who had a number of um, uh, uh, different kinds of chronic digestive problems. I've heard it from people who suffered from acid reflux. I've heard it from people who suffered from um, uh, uh, chronic constipation. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've one. heard it sometimes from people who have had, you know, more serious digestive challenges. Right. Um, um, so I would say that's the most frequent um, um, sort of anecdotal uh, yeah. um, uh, testimonials that, 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 that I've heard through the years. Yeah, I, I want to reiterate the one point, because some of the things that we buy in the store, they may have started out the same, not only heat treated and killed off no longer live, but some even worse so treated with forms of antibiotics that we would call preservatives. And, you know, when you consume those things, um, they don't necessarily know to stop killing. <laughs> so we're actually going in the wrong direction sometimes with the things that we consume because they have all these chemicals in them. Um, so let's, let's leave uh, fermentation. What's the uh, a day in the life of Sander Kraut, <laughs> Sander Katz? What's it like? What do you do? Well, I mean, my days are, are really quite, quite varied. Um, uh, you know, I've spent most of the pandemic um, uh, writing, writing a new book um, about my travels. So, you know, for the, for the years before that, I was doing a ton of traveling. And so, you know, when I was on the road, I was doing a lot of teaching and, and public speaking um, and, you know, at, you know, where, where I had time, um, also learning and investigating local food traditions. Um, and then, um, you know, when I would come home from those travels, um, um, you know, home was a place of, um, um, you know, recuperation and, and rejuvenation. And um, I've been keeping a garden since that first garden that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, and so that's, that's a huge source of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, regeneration and connection for me. So, I mean, I love my garden. I spend a lot of time gardening. Um, right now you can't see it, but on the other side of my computer, um, you know, spread out on a, on, on, on a big uh, uh, newspaper or, or tomatoes. Um, uh, today, I think I'm going to make a, a, a tomato salsa. I was just thinking about that this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I have I have all the elements I need right in the garden. Um, um, so, uh, you know, the garden continues to be a, a place of huge inspiration for me. I love to play around with fermentation. I mean, I ferment a lot in my everyday life. I, um, uh, I made, I made some yogurt last night that, that fermented overnight and I just put it in the refrigerator this morning. I have this, uh, the NAM, the, um, uh, fermenting um, uh, pork ribs that I'll, that I'll make in a couple of days wow. uh, 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 sitting right here. Um, you know, every week or so I've been making a jar of um, uh, sour pickles, the kind of pickles that I, that I grew up eating that I, that I love. And by the way, cucumbers are among the most challenging of vegetables to ferment because they're ready in the hottest weather. Um, and um, uh the heat can activate enzymes that make them get soft and mushy. Um, so mm. that's challenging. Whereas, you know, cabbages are typically harvested in a cooler time of the year um, um, and, you know, can ferment through the, um, uh, through the late autumn and, and winter months where the environment is cooler. Um, so the, you know, the hot weather vegetables just, um, um, you know, are, are, are a bigger challenge. Um, 
you know, I, I write, I have a steady stream of emails that I need to keep up with. Oh boy, I, um, I can imagine. Um, um, I like to swim and go to local swimming holes. Um, um, you know, I have, I have uh, a partner and friends. I like to, you know, spend time with people. Um, I, I like to read, you know, I have, I have a lot of interests, but, That's you know, great. I would say that the garden is a really kind of central uh, uh, focus for me. Oh, we share similar interests myself too. Um, having just moved, I'm starting over. And, uh, you know, I have uh, only a few things planted, papaya and aloe vera. I used to have all kinds of fruit trees. I'm starting completely from scratch, but have a long ways to go. <laughs> um, Sandra, where would the best place uh, for people to go to get your books be? Um, well, I mean, I would say where, wherever you like to support, uh, buy books. I mean, I, I would encourage people to try to not buy books from Amazon. Um, 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 just because, you know, Amazon, you know, really sort of dictates low prices to, I, I mean, you know, an author makes less than half from Amazon uh, per book, what they would make from any other source, which is the only way that Amazon can sell their, 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 their books and other things so cheaply. Yeah. Um, so anywhere besides that, I mean, on my website, you can order books from, um, um, you know, my friends who have a local fermentation business, uh, fermentation culture. So my website is wildfermentation.com. You can find out about my books. You can find out about my workshops. Um, you can find, you know, all kinds of interesting fermentation related links on the World Wide yeah. web. Um, lots of information about fermentation. So, so, so check out my website, wildfermentation.com. Um, and, um, and definitely um, um, check out my books. And, and actually, I didn't even show you my two other books, which is... Um, um, a book published a year ago called Fermentation as Metaphor that's um, um, all these microscopy images that I have um, generated and collected along with an essay about um, uh, broader implications of fermentation and a book that I wrote in 2006 called The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved Inside oh. America's Underground Food Movements. And this is about basically grassroots movements to reclaim food. I love um, it. Yeah. I want to thank you so much. I could go on forever. You are such a, uh, a breath of fresh air to talk to. And wow, I think I've been smiling ear to ear this whole time. Absolutely love you. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I thank you for your interest and for the opportunity to, um, you know, share my excitement um, about fermentation with the people who are watching your podcast. Ah, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.